Hey folks, Tim Newman with Soft Light Studios coming to you once again today from Columbus, Ohio. We're still in lockdown in Columbus, Ohio, as is most of the United States. And hell, if you looked at the weather outside today, being in lockdown wasn't necessarily the worst punishment in the world, so I could live with that. I want you to take a look at something here. There's a picture I'm going to pop up here in front of the video introduction. I want you to take a quick look at it. This is a Munker color illusion and believe it or not the colored circles that you see here on the left side and the right side they're identical our project today in photoshop is going to be to recreate this munker color illusion and we're going to do it via a number of really cool tools in photoshop and we're going to do it building two documents into a third document let's take a look in order to complete this color illusion that we referred to in the introduction, we are going to create three different Photoshop documents. One document we might think of as the left side of our illusion. Another document we might think of as the right side of our illusion. And the third document would be an aggregate of documents one and two so that we can actually test out the color illusion and see that it in fact does work. Now, when you're done with this, I doubt that you're going to sit back and go, voila, I've got a uh, photographic quality print that I'm ready to print here. I don't expect that. But what I do expect is you're going to have a ton of new Photoshop skills under your belt. You're going to learn a lot about the marquee selection tool you're going to learn about effectively applying the modifier keys to that selection tool process. You're going to learn a lot about guide layouts and how to use them to your advantage. You're definitely going to be working with the paint bucket tool and you're going to be learning some stuff about color theory. One of the cool things that you're going to get here is the ability to play with a color set in the library control panel. And that's a feature that comes to you via Adobe's Creative Cloud subscription. And I I am going to provide a color library to you via a Google Drive link that you can see down below in the description and you can simply download and add that color library into your library's control panel. Now I'll provide the colors as well numerically so you don't have to do that if you don't want to but I would definitely encourage exploring that library's control panel and the features that the uh, library is extended with via the Creative Cloud subscription. All right, with all of that in mind, let's hop over into Photoshop and get started. So over here in Photoshop, the first thing that we want to do is create a new document. And that's as simple as coming up here and doing File, New, and you'll note that there's a shortcut key labeled there for you. It's Command N on a Mac, Control N on Windows. Try to remember those shortcut keys as you work through these things over and over again. So you can see here we have our new document dialog box. I'm gonna go with a width of six inches and a height of six inches. Gives us a nice square document to work with. 300 pixels per inch, I like that because that's a nice print resolution. I don't think we're gonna print this, but it's already set that way and I'm comfortable working at that resolution. If you were just gonna save this for the web, you might do it at 132, but I tend to always work at 300 pixels per inch in Photoshop and I know that I can downsample later to a smaller resolution at export time. RGB color mode makes a lot of sense if I'm working with photographs or I am planning on printing on a inkjet uh, photographic printer. If I were planning on going offset press, well then I might switch that to CMYK mode. But most of the time we'll be working in the RGB color mode. My bit depth, I always like working in 16-bit bit depth. It gives me the capacity to hold on to more unique colors in my document. Uh, not necessarily going to be a problem here, but more of a default for me. I don't really care about background contents here. I'm going to leave it at transparent because that's where it's set, but it doesn't really make any difference for what we're doing here. Besides that, I can change it after the fact if I need to. And then last but not least, I'm going to work in this Pro Photo RGB color space. Yes, it's a big color space, more than I can possibly output or print, but again, I know that I can always downsample at output time. So I try to stick with the bigger settings while I'm working in Photoshop, and then remember at export time, I can downsample for the intended output device that I'm going to. So let's go ahead and create that document. 
Okay, now that we have our blank document created, let's take a moment here to talk about what we're getting ready to do. If you remember looking at the sample document in the introduction, you will remember that there were 60 colored stripes in that document, 30 of one color, 30 alternating of another color. And there was that round circle, which apparently was sitting between those two layers of stripes behind one layer, but in front of another layer. So if you're deconstructing this in your head, you should be thinking to yourself, well, that should be three layers. Bottom layer with a bunch of stripes in it, middle layer with the circle in it, top layer with the alternating stripes in it. So that's what we're getting ready to do here in Photoshop. We are going to rely heavily on the guidelines to make that happen in conjunction with the rectangular marquee tool. So let's jump into that and get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is come down here to the view menu and we are gonna click on new guide layout and that will bring up the new guide layout dialog box. Now you can see this makes guidelines visible and we have some guidelines in there from a previous document that we worked on. Remember the new guide layout always remembers the last layout settings you use. So let's clear out those columns. We don't need those. Let's go ahead and make our rows set to the 60 that we want. And we need to turn off the margins here. We don't need those. Now things look a little funny at the moment. That's because we need to click on clear existing guides to make the stuff from the previous settings go away. And now we have our 60 stripes, if you will, laid out here in these guidelines. So now it's time to load up the rectangular marquee tool and start selecting these areas that we're gonna fill in. So I'm gonna hit the M key to bring up the rectangular marquee tool. You can see that tool is now active. If you get something other than that, just keep hitting the M key until you get the rectangular marquee tool. If hitting the M key by itself doesn't work, try Shift M over and over again. And uh, if you don't like that Shift key, go into preferences and turn off, use Shift key for tool switch. So up here, I just have to be somewhere near the edge of this top guideline. Notice I'm off the left-hand side of the document, and the way the selection tools work in Photoshop when you're in non-artboard mode is they automatically constrain to the edges of the document. So I don't have to start right at the left edge and go exactly to the right edge. I can start a little earlier than that and go a little further than that, and it'll automatically constrain that selection to that area. Now. I want to draw my next stripe in here, so I'm going to skip a row to do that. I'm going to hold down the Shift key, and you may notice if you're looking at the Rectangular Marquee Tool cursor up here, just to the left at the top of the document, as soon as I hold down that Shift key, that little plus symbol shows up, meaning that I'm going to add this selection to the selection above it. So and you can see that, in fact, is exactly what happens. Perfect, right? There's our next stripe. So I'm just going to repeat this process over and over again and rather than have you sit there and watch me draw these lines over and over again i'm going to stop the video here and i'll come back to you when i've drawn all 30 of those so be right back okay so while i went away and saved you a bunch of time you'll see that i have a bunch of my selections drawn here and they're marching around nicely on the screen. I have one to go and I wanted you to watch this just because I wanted to show you one possible thing that could happen to you here. Let's say you forget to hold down that shift key before you add into the selection and you're like, okay, I'm going to start drawing. Uh-oh. All of the other ones that I had already drawn are gone. And if you say, okay, I don't want that selection. I'm going to get rid of that one now. Let's come up here and do a select reselect from the select menu, you notice we get that little one back. And at this point, you're starting to panic because it's taking you about three minutes to draw those in. Turns out, if you just use the command Z key on the Mac, control Z key on Windows, you can back through the steps you have recently taken. And eventually, I went back four steps, I got these selections back. So that's a really cool thing. And that didn't used to be the case in Photoshop. It used to be you could undo one thing, and then that was the end of the Command-Z buffer. So now they've added that in, and I think that's way better than uh, losing all that selection work. I'm going to hold down that Shift key, and I am adding in my last rectangular marquee tool down here at the bottom. 
Now, one thing that's a little difficult to tell here is exactly where each of these rectangular marquees are. It's like, okay, did I skip every other row like I was supposed to? Let me assure you, as soon as you fill these in with the paint bucket tool, it's going to be obvious whether or not you messed up. Now that we have all of our rectangular marquee selections marching around the screen here, we are ready to color them in. And the easiest way to do that is using the paint bucket tool. I'm gonna to hit the G key and you notice the paint bucket tool becomes active. That's the one that we're looking for there. If I keep hitting the G key, you will notice that I get one of three different tools there. Ultimately, I wanna make sure I get the one that looks like that. Now, if you loaded up my color set, into your library's control panel. You could just directly go over here and pick the color right out of the control panel by clicking on it. And you'll notice immediately that color is now our foreground color in the color picker. Now, for those of you that didn't do that, I'm just gonna click on the color picker and I'm gonna bring up the color picker dialog box. And you can put this color in directly by inputting the values that you see here. And you don't have to input every value that you see here. You can use one of five different color sets here. First is hue, saturation, brightness. You can copy those three values. Second is the RGB or red, green, blue values. You can use those three values. There is the lab color mode values. That would be our lightness channel and our A axis and B axis values. Or you could use the CMYK values right here, these percentages. Last but not least, you could also use this value right down here. This is a web safe color. So you have five different mechanisms for taking the color out of here and putting it into your color picker and getting it. All right, I'm gonna click on okay. And I'm gonna go up here and just click right on this very top space. Look at that. All of them got filled in with one click. And just looking at the settings for the paint bucket, you can see that I've got anti-alias turned on, contiguous turned on, and I've got all layers turned off. So that's just keeping us focused on this layer and filling in the active selection that is here. So there we go. We have our first 30 stripes in place. Now, let's go ahead and do a select inverse and you'll notice immediately by doing the select inverse our selections shift to the alternating stripes and we are ready to fill those in with the notable exception that we want to create a new blank layer to do that in so that we don't put them on the same layer. We want to keep them separate. Remember we said we needed to have those three layers in order for this to look like the sample document that we showed at the beginning. We are going to fill that in. We are going to go with the B color out of the color library that I shared with you. You'll notice that's instantly become our foreground color there. Again, for those of you that didn't get the color library, I'm going to click on the color picker. I'm going to give you a minute here to look at those values. Pick whichever color mode that you want out of here and copy those three or four values and copy it into your color picker and you'll be all set. For me, typically the quickest one is the web safe color right here because I only have to put that in one field. So I assume you got that. We're going to click on OK and we're going to come up here and click on any one of these areas that's transparent behind it and is surrounded with our marching ants for a selection. And there you go. There is our alternate stripes. And as we said, they are in separate layers here. So that's perfect. Now we have one last thing that we need to do. And that is we need to put our colored circle in the middle. And we really want that to be exactly centered in the document. That doesn't have to be, but aesthetically speaking, that's the way to go. Now, the easiest way to do this, come up here, do a view, new guide layout, and let's just go with two columns and I don't need any gutter there. And we are going to go with back up one, two rows. I am not going to clear my existing guides. I want to keep those just in case. So now I've got exactly what I need there. I have got a guideline going right down the center. And oh, by the way, one of these guides here turns out to be the middle of this document it turns out to be right there. So what we need to do now is we need to draw a circle. We also need to make sure that we draw that circle 
on its own layer. So I'm gonna come over here and click the plus icon. And that gives us layer three over here. I'm gonna come back here to the middle and I'm gonna hit the M key. That gives me the rectangular marquee tool again. I'm gonna hit it one more time and you notice there's the elliptical marquee tool. Now, because I have guides here, our circle will immediately start from the intersection of that vertical guide and that horizontal guide that we're closest to. Now you notice as I'm drawing this out, it's not drawing from the center. Easy enough to fix. On the Mac, it's the Option key. On Windows, it's the Alt key. Now we're centered. However, it isn't necessarily a circle. That's as simple as adding in the Shift key. Now I have a perfect circle and it's centered in the document for me automatically. Pretty convenient that those two modifier keys do that for us. Remember, when you're using modifier keys with any of these selection tools, let go of the mouse first, modifier keys second. There we have our selection that we are going to fill in with that yellow. Again, we're gonna go grab the paint bucket tool. We're gonna to come over here and sample the yellow out of our color set 01, that C color there. And I'm gonna pop open the color picker so those of you who don't have the color library loaded at home can pick up the values right out of the color picker here. So pick whichever ones are of most interest to you, whichever color system you prefer to type them in, in doesn't matter, just as long as you pick one and stick with it and uh, add those into your color picker and your color picker and you'll end up with the same color that I am using here. I assume everybody's got that by now. I'm gonna click okay and I'm gonna click here in the center of the circle. There we go. We have our nice bright yellow circle in our document. Now it's sitting on top of the stripes, which is what we said we didn't want, but that's okay. Real straightforward. Let's just take layer three over here in the layers control panel and drag it down and put it between layers two and one. There we go. Now one of the things that I'm gonna do here just for clarification's sake, I like doing this. I'm gonna double click on layer one. I'm gonna type blue stripes. I'm gonna double, double click on this layer three and I'm gonna say this is yellow circle. And I am going to double click on this layer two up here and say this is orange stripes. Pretty straightforward. That's it. Our first document is all done. We could go ahead and just do a command semicolon to turn off our guides just to see what it looks like. Pretty cool. And really, for as complicated as it looks, once we get used to the fact that we're using those guide layouts and the rectangular marquee tool and that additive modifier tool for the selections was pretty straightforward. Wasn't that hard to create. At this point, what I wanna do is I wanna save this so I don't lose my work also because I'm going to use this document to create the next document with just a few simple steps. So let's go ahead and get that happening. First thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna come do a file, save, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and save it on my computer. New dialog box here that allows you to support cloud documents as well, but we're gonna go locally. I'm gonna put it in my root or my home folder drive, and uh, I'm gonna call this orange and blue. And I'm calling it that because I think of the orange being on top here over the top of that yellow circle. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change a few things around here. Well, one of the first things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the blue stripes and I'm gonna drag them all the way up onto the top. And I'm gonna take the orange stripes and I'm gonna drag them down on the bottom. And now you see that it really looks like we should be calling it blue and orange, which is exactly what we're going to do, except we're going to come over here and do a file save as. We're going to again put it on local computer. I'm putting it in my home folder. And this is now going to be called blue and orange. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. Now, one of the things that you should do here and pay attention to, it's likely on by default but make sure when you save these, you save them as Photoshop files and that you save the layers. If you don't save them as PSDs and you lose the layers, this isn't gonna work very well. Now, the other thing I would like to do just to make this one a little bit unique is I wanna rotate the lines around 90 degrees. 
I don't want to rotate the circle though. If it's a perfect circle, you won't notice it. But I do want to come up here and I want to select the blue stripes while I've got orange stripes selected. I could just use the command key to add into collection. So there's one command key or control key on Windows. And now I have those two selected. I'm going to do a command T on the Mac. That's a control T on Windows. And up here in the tool option bar, you'll see this little icon right here, which is the rotation icon. And I'm going to come in here, double click in here to highlight that field, make sure it's all highlighted. And I'm going to type in 180 and just hit enter to accept that. And then the A key, oops, let's go A, there we go. Okay. Got to hit enter a couple times there to make that go away. But now we have our document rotated around. The blue stripes are still on top, but we've put the orange stripe at the very top of the document in terms of looking at it from top to bottom. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna do a file open, and I can really do an open recent here, and I wanna go and reload that orange and blue document. And there you have it right there. And you can see that the blue stripe is on top in this one versus when I come over here and click on this, the orange stripe is at the top on this one. So that rotation is what gave us that little bit of difference there between the two of them. Also, as you click back and forth between the two tabs, you notice how in the document that's orange and blue, all of a sudden that circle doesn't look as yellow anymore. It's changed color. And the first thing that a lot of people think is, wow, some kind of bug there, that's uh, really strange. And what I want you to do to just kind of take a look at these side by side is come up here to Window, and come down here to the word arrange and go over to two up vertical. And now you can see them side by side. So this is a, a pretty good comparison between the two. And instantly you can see that, wow, for sure, the shade of that circle in the center has really changed. It looks very different. The fact is it has not changed the retina and the color cones in your eye because of color proximity to one another have totally changed the way that center color looks. In a minute, we're gonna come up to document number three and give you a way of really exploring this in depth, which I think is gonna be pretty cool. Okay, in document number three, what we wanna do is combine these two documents together. Um, one of these documents is six inches by six inches. The other document is six inches by six inches. Seems like it'd be pretty easy to put them into a 12 inch by six inch document side by side. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And you're going to get a real quick introduction to some of the move and drag and uh, drop features in Photoshop that I think are pretty cool and can save you a lot of time, especially when you're compositing. So let's watch how this works. So the first thing I'm going to do is come up here to my window range and uh, I am going to consolidate these all back to tabs. So I've got them all tabbed up here at the top and then I'm going to come up here and once again, I'm going to do a file new. That's a command N on the Mac control N on windows and notice that our measurement system got changed. That's okay. We're going to jump back into inches over here and we're going to make this 12 inches wide we are going to go six inches tall and all the other settings I, I am fine with 300 pixels range, RGB color mode, 16 bits, transparent, pro photo RGB. I'm happy with all those other settings. So let's click on create. There we go. New blank document. So if our originals were six by six and this is 12 by six, we ought to be able to put one on the left and one on the right. Let's go ahead and do that. First thing we do is come over here and click on the orange and blue tab over here, bringing this document up. And what we want is all three layers. We don't want to just drag over one layer, but we all we want all three layers. Now there's a couple ways we could do this. One is we could flatten out this image and bring it over as one layer, but then that's going to lose a feature that I'm going to show you in a minute. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave this top layer selected as it currently is now. We're going to hold down the shift key and grab that bottom layer, so all three are active. And then we're gonna click and start dragging. You notice all three layer strips come with us. We're gonna come up here to the, our new untitled one document. Now, previously, I had you hold down the shift key to put these in the center. Not really all that necessary here because we are going to move it around anyway. So I'm gonna drop it off and it's not gonna be centered, that's fine. But all three layers are still active over here in the layer strip, meaning that if I hit the V key to bring up the move tool, 
all three layers will move at once. And now I can actually use the boundaries of the document to just snap that in place. That's exactly where I want that to be. I didn't resize this time, it was just a simple move. So there is no need to hit return or enter because I'm not committing a change, I'm just moving the layer. So A key to turn that off, there we go. That layer, or those three layers I should say, is now in our new document over on that left hand side. Now we're going to go over and grab our blue and orange tab. And we're going to make sure that we have all three layers selected here. I think you remember last time we had two selected. So I just have to, on the Mac, hold down the command key. That would be the control key on Windows. Add that third layer into our selection of layers. Just make sure no matter what state you're in, that all three of them are highlighted in this lighter gray. Again, click and start dragging. Go up to that untitled one tab and just drop this off anywhere in there. And, and if you're new to this, you're thinking, oh no, I just put this on top of my other content. Not a problem. All three layers are still active over here because we just brought them in together. If we hit the V key for the move tool, we can take all three layers and put them where we want them. And we're gonna just snap them over to the right-hand edge of the document, of course, centered between top and bottom. Again, no transformation of the content, just a raw move. So all we have to do is hit the A key to get out of the move tool mode. So now we have them all together in one document. We had the left side document on the left, the right side document on the right. I'm gonna do a command zero on the Mac, control zero on Windows to size these up so they fit exactly in our tabbed interface. We get them a little bigger. And there we go. There's document number three created for us. And the reason we created document number three is twofold. One is, I really wanted to show you how to move and put these things together and how they snap together really quickly. Plus, I want to take the final step of showing you that this color in the middle has not changed. I'm gonna come down here and grab my yellow circle at the bottom, which came from my original orange and blue document. I'm going to hit the V key to turn on the move tool. Now that's the only layer that's gonna move. And I'm gonna to start to drag this over. Watch what happens when it hits the middle. Ah, doesn't work so well, does it? Well, now let's think about this. And that really comes down completely to what our layer order is here, right? So let's go ahead and a hit the A key and just drop that off there and think about this. Well, our blue stripes and our orange stripes up top are totally blocking that circle. So let's take our blue stripes that are at the top and drag them down to the bottom. Well, there we go. That's better, right? And let's take our yellow circle that's up here outside of those orange stripes and drag it into the middle. Uh, now we're making some progress here. And we can now see if we come back here to our lower yellow circle and we hit the V key, we can now see exactly what's happening. We can move this between and it stays underneath there, no problem. Except we do have one more issue. I don't know if you've spotted it yet, but in both documents, we have now put the orange stripes on top. And this is where labeling layers comes in really, really handy. So up here, my orange stripes on the top, if I turn this on and off, I can see those are the right orange stripes. So maybe I'm gonna come over here and just rename this layer and call this right orange stripes. So that must mean these are the left orange stripes. No problem, let's go ahead and rename those. And then if I look down here, yep, those are my left blue stripes. Obviously the other ones are the right blue stripes. So let's just go ahead and, uh, oops, make sure you click on the text, not on the layer strip. Let's go ahead and, uh, Yep, I totally wiped that one out. Um, that is going to be our left blue stripes, but that's okay. Easy to fix, never panic. And we double click here on the text, and these will be our right blue stripes. Now there's no guessing when we're looking at these layer strips. And I can even rename my circles here. This is my right yellow circle, and this is what was my left yellow circle. So now they all make sense. Now it should be obvious what the problem is. The right orange stripes should be at the bottom and the right blue stripes should be at the top. So let's come down here, drag these up here to the top and let's take our right orange stripes and drag these down here to the bottom. There we got it. Makes all the sense in the world when you see those flipped around like that. Last but not least, 
Let's click on that left yellow circle layer. Move tool still on, we never turn it off. And now this really brings home what's happening here in this sample exercise. I think this makes all the sense in the world in terms of what's happening here with this color illusion. You can see without a doubt they're the same color, but it's just a matter of what colors sitting on top of them changes your eye's perception of color. A couple more thoughts and then we'll wrap this up. So if you followed along, there you have it, your first Munker color illusion. Um, I think this is really cool stuff. I love the color illusion stuff in general. It really talks to color context and how that matters in photography. But I also thought this was a really fun exercise to walk you through. So I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it solidified a lot of Photoshop concepts for you and a few color theory concepts along the way. In the meantime, I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're staying indoors when you can, only going out for those essential goods and services, things like trips to the state store, you know, places like that, um, or at the very least, your local dispensary. No, I'm totally kidding. I'm not advocating any bad behavior here at all. I would personally never do that. Okay, stay healthy, stay sane, and uh, let's pray for this thing to wrap up so we can get out there and shoot some pictures outside. I'll see you out there. Thank <laughs> you.